I'm Bob Avery. I'm an extension agent in Sumner County. I've been in Sumner County for about 12 years. I worked in Robertson County for 15 years as a 4-H agent there from uh, 82 to 98. I went to Nashville and worked 50-50 position, horticulture and 4-H position from 98 to 2005. I've been in Sumner County since 2005. And from the time that I've been there, I I'm, have the responsibilities for all the horticulture questions and information that come to UT Extension in, in our county. So I work with <coughs> homeowners with their trees and shrubs and flowers and lawns and vegetable gardens and their small fruits if they have questions. And then I have, uh, I'll work with commercial fruits and vegetable folks, primarily the vegetables and strawberries. If we think about Summer County, we have about 15 acres or so of strawberry production going on. And then also for row crop producers, primarily the questions I get relate to tobacco production still. We have a little over a thousand acres of burly tobacco that's still produced in our county. And uh, so I get those questions from time to time, most of the time when it relates to diseases. So, so when I, I've, I've known Emmett for a few years, had, had a question for me a few years ago about <coughs> establishing grapes. And so he contacted me about this particular conference and, and uh, asked me to speak about small fruits for the homeowner. And I'm going to include four different fruits today. I'm going to start with grapes and I'm going to move through those pretty quickly because I'm sure you're pretty familiar with those. But I want to be able to talk about primarily uh, blackberries, blueberries, and strawberries as a possibilities for you as homeowners and thinking about how you might use, well, I, I really thought maybe this might be something that you'd be interested in, in wine production, possibly. And so you know, for, for all of these presentations to think about something that's pretty unique because I've never researched how much juice before, because that would be important. To me. There's some... There's a wide variety of information out there I've discovered about different, the different juices and amounts. And so I thought for someone who is a homeowner, backyard, fruit grower, to, I would, if I'm doing it, I wanted to have an idea about how many plants would I need to get X amount of juice. And so we'll, we'll go there a little bit, then I'll maybe have some opportunity to answer, ask, answer your questions that you might have. So I guess we want to start with, okay, how much room do I need for these particular plants? And, and so it depends on some of, the, some of the culture that you might use. And for, for strawberries, I'm thinking primarily of the matted row system. And I'll tell you, I, I don't have a copy of this, but if, if you, I, my email address will be at the end of this presentation. And if you'll email me if you would want this, then I'll make it a PDF and send it to you, okay? I'll be glad to do that. And, and I guess I'll go back and say, most all of the information that I'm going to use today came from Dr. Dave Lockwood. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Dr. Lockwood, and, and we've worked together for a number of years, and, and uh, I saw him at the Peak Tennessee Conference last week or so, and, and he's been aware that I was doing this, and so he provided some information for me. So we think about how much room, because when you consider, especially when we look at it from a juice aspect, which was kind of where I was headed with this, I have to think about, okay, how many plants am I going to need, and then how many, so the, how does that transfer into the space that I'm going to need to be able to grow this particular crop? And so if you look at the strawberries in the man row system, and I considered probably, for the most part, the information that I'm using today to be man and row system, for the commercial producers that are in my county, they're using the plastic culture system, the annual culture, they'll call it, and, and uh, growing strawberries on plastic and about 15,000 plants per acre. So when I look at the matted grow system and think of how to get that started, use some, there's some different kinds of information out there, but, but on an acre basis, you start, start with about seven, seven or 8,000 plants and then let them run her out and fill in that map for you. Ending up with that space of 18 to 24 inches between plants to start with, really, to start with, because they're going to fill in. Normally we're trying to work on having plants 
Strawberry plants have about a square foot per plant. That's the space that they need to be fully productive with what they're going to grow. And some of that depends on the variety as well, but plant height and maturity, you see that as well. Uh, blackberries, thorned and thornless. Between plants, 20 to 40, 20 to 30 inches if they're those types, 10 to 12 feet in between the rows, 42 to 60 inches for their maturity. Uh, <coughs> talk about the culture a little bit there but but I consider for black bears I'm going to have them trellised if, if it's no more than just the single wire and we'll talk look, look at how high to do that how tall blueberries four inches for four feet between the plants six inches to six feet depending um, we kind of think about those mature plants Trying to maintain those at four by four by four to, to provide the best light penetration and also to keep the fruit with well within reach for the harvest. So how are we doing? Good? And then grapes, you're familiar with those, so we're looking at in the row and between the rows and also the heights of those plants. <clears throat> so here's... Here's a slide that he had with some information and, and what I was interested in and for the most part here was, okay, if I'm growing these crops, how long is it going to be before they're in full production? And it's one of the hardest things to do because if you've, if you've heard Dave talk about blueberries before or some of, some of the other perennial fruit, fruit crops to say, uh, do not let them fruit for X number of years. Well, you're out there and you're loving them blooming and you want to, yes, you want to enjoy those first fruits. But, he says, and, and it's the research has, has indicated, you, know, you need to let that plant alone, not fruit, use that energy, develop that root system and develop the plant overall so it's going to be more productive in the long run. They did, uh, they did some research, <clears throat> did some research on blueberries and for those... If, if you wait, if you can stand it, if you can wait that second or third and really not get into a heavy harvest until that fourth year, that plant will surpass the total harvest of one that you started to pick earlier, you harvested from earlier. It's going to be more productive over time. So this yield at maturity, we look at the yield at maturity, that 15 to 20 pounds, and, and when, it get, when you get right down to it, when you look at fruit harvest, the fruit harvest, it all boils down to pounds. Everything's by pounds. I've got strawberry producers that sell by the quart, and I have strawberry producers that sell by the pound. And by the pound is the most popular, most popular these days. How about cross-pollination? Strawberries don't need cross-pollination. Blackberries, raspberries don't. Grapes except for muscadines. Blueberries, yes, they do. Um, but if you, if you have more than one variety of any of these plants, you will increase your harvest. If you have any, any even though cross-pollination is not required, if you provide a variety that's going to be pollinating it, uh, that can allow that cross to happen at near the same time, but during the time that, it, that pollination is occurring, you'll, you'll increase your harvest and and as, as a result, increase your pounds. Of course, for the desirable sites, we've got, we've got to have full sun. What is full sun? It's at least six hours a day. Eight's better. Even more during the summer, that'd be great. Elevation, frost, and disease protection so we don't, we don't want to be on the very top of the slope. We don't want to be at the bottom of the slope. We want to be at a place where that air drainage can move, not settle down uh, for disease protection protection a lot of it is related to moisture as well soils pH arrangement what's what's needed there of course blueberries 4.8 to 5.2 in our county if you're in the central basin if you're soil if you're in uh, Hendersonville Gallatin Maybe Beth Page getting over that way a little bit. You know, your pH is you're on top of a limestone rock, and and uh, normally pH is going to be fine between six and six point five. 
The tendency is, however, when you climb the Highland Rim, the tendency is for the soils to become a little more acidic. Yes, sir? Blueberries <coughs> require very acid soil, obviously. Yes. What's the best way to <coughs> get more acid? Get there? What's the best way to get there? Yeah. Elemental sulfur is the most uh, practical and also ease of use. Elemental sulfur. Well, I've got some. <coughs> Uh, the mulch them with pine. Yes. And they seem to be doing okay with that. Mm -hmm. They're several years old. Now. Well, there's, there are some of those uh, products like pine, pine needles, which are acidic, and there are some other mulches that are acidic mulches, but they will help maintain that pH where it is. They're not going to move the pH. They're not going to move it appreciably so if, so and it's really for for blueberries it's just really important and we all if, if, if you've grown blueberries outside of their preferable range then you've observed the effects of the, the pH on the leaves and how they look and, I, and really all on the overall health of the plant because blueberries don't have the greatest root systems in the world to start with and so to be in that, they need to be in that environment that they have to have to do their best. And so it's, it does start with the soil pH. And for all of these, we really, if we can increase the organic matter content of our soils before we set the crop, we're much better off. Of course, we're talking about organic matter, so that means that we're going to have to replenish that over time. But it, it's so important for water holding capacity, microorganisms development in the soil, and maintaining that healthy soil profile within that root system for that plant. Conserving moisture, there's weed control, there are all kinds of pluses to using the organic matter and including organic mulches to do that. We've got to have a well drained soil, internal and surface drainage. I'd uh, love to have a rooting depth of 30 to 36 inches. It may be a little bit challenging in some places, but uh, really helpful to do that. And also the moderate fertility. I, I spoke to a group of master gardeners at a training in Davidson County earlier this week and, and speaking about organic matter content. We Generally across the state, we figure that it's going to be about 1%. In some of our places, then we're going to be glad if we have 1%. If we're in Middle, I know for us in Middle Tennessee, if we think about the high, whether it's the Highland Rim soils, but certainly for these soils that are part of the Central Basin, if we're in Nashville, Hendersonville, and pretty much all of Middle Tennessee, um, if you look at soil survey maps, and I think that would be a great thing for you to do as well, look at your soil survey map and understand what type of soil that you have. Most of the soils that I look at for people in Sumner County, they're they're classified as eroded soils. If they're classified as eroded soils, and that a lot of that topsoil that formed and over these millions of years, well, it's not there anymore. <clears throat> and so that affects that rooting depth, and it also affects the organic matter that's already in that surface soil. So full sun's most important uh, elevation choices can be very helpful. I was not aware of this and looking at information that Dr. Dave shared with me to avoid sites where we've had tomatoes and potatoes and eggplants or strawberries and we've grown within four to five years and so we're looking at some possibilities of carryover of disease problems. Persistent herbicides that have been used within recent years, there are some of those that are just, they have that persistence that's outside the realm of what we might have been used to in the past and so we have to be careful about that. Other brambles, wild or domesticated, that are grown within 600 feet. So if we've got a wild blueberry, blackberry patch nearby and we're growing cane berries, if we can get rid of that, then that would be helpful. Or if there's an area where we've got Phytophthora root rot or crown gall, crown gall um, thinking about Phytophthora being one of those that's Carried with the water, moves with the water as well. Yes. You would say that goes for grapes too. <laughs> yes. The grapes, yeah. Okay. Not necessarily. No, not necessarily <laughs> grapes. Okay. No. Because I'm considering what would have, what would be, you know, there are going to be some pests though 
that could utilize the wild blackberry as a host and then transfer to other fruit bearing crops. <coughs> I mean, certainly blackberry to blackberry, but even, you know, as we, we're going to talk about spotted wing drosophila, and that's a host plant. I mean, blackberry is going to be a host plant for that, and it affects multiple fruit crops. So, yes. So, there are multiple reasons to try to provide some control. So we're going to begin with that soil test, and especially if I'm growing blueberries, but <clears throat> anytime we're providing a new crop rotation, <clears throat> eliminate those noxious weeds, remove the barriers for good air drainage. If, if I can do some clearing of trees or lowering canopies or raising canopies to provide some air movement around, if that's something that I can do. Uh, address poor water drainage in areas if it's applicable. We talked about that in our master gardener training the other night. Well, what can I do? Well, you can install tile if you want to. That's not going to be very practical. Practical, but you might amend your soils in way in a way that will allow water to percolate down and out. So I can I can do that in a number of ways, but I prefer to do it myself with organic mulching and introducing that organic matter and preparing that. Maybe even. Uh, if you have the opportunity to do some ripping of the soil to break through, maybe you have a hard pan. Even where I live between White House and Portland, I've got, I've got a property that has a great soils, but it also has about 18 inches down. It's got a hard pan that if you want to get through it, then you have to have a tamping bar with the big wedge, you know, to pound because it's so impermeable. So that doesn't allow, that's what that's saying is that doesn't allow water to pass through doesn't allow roots to penetrate. So you've got that hard layer. Another char so a characteristic that you might, as you search for your soil and your property and gain a better understanding about what you have, and I, I, if you want to, uh, I didn't put this in the program, but, but if you want, if you're not aware of the soil type on your property, then if you'll Google Web Soil Survey, then you'll get the NRCS site it's so user friendly these days that you can type in your address and it'll pull up your property and you can actually zoom in and then uh, move to the next, to a new page, a new window on a tab and actually see the soil types and it'll tell you over here in a, in a listing the types of soil that's within your defined area and also what percent within the defined areas, that particular type, how many acres that ends up being, <coughs> etc. But there's also a hard copy survey that's in most county, I'd say all of our county extension office have a hard copy of the manual, the, the soil survey, and of course the NRCS office does. It's a USDA office that's in most counties. And I like to go to the web soil survey first and get the types and see what information that's there and then I'm going to go to the hard copy to understand more about my types. That's where I learned that I, my soil has a fragile pan and that's where uh, I can get that better defined information. Is it, a good, is it a good soil? Does it drain well? Is it suitable for building a pond? Which gives you kind of an indication of the makeup of, the, of it as well. Row orientation. This is one of those facts that I just, you know, sometimes I just have these facts and research bears it out, but it just doesn't make quite sense to me. But if you can, you want to orient your rows north and south. And that results in the best sunlight exposure within the row. And on sloping fields, if you run across a slope, it's going to sure lessen the problems with soil erosion. But there's going to be a little bit of difference there in that light interception, and the spacing might be need to be greater to lessen the potential of shading within the rows. So, you know, it just it still doesn't just visually I can't get that together. But the research bears that out. I put, I put this calendar in there, and it, you know it says clean up the orchard there, and, and, and a lot of this relates to orchard. But I guess for most fruit, fruit crops. The best thing that we like to do, or we enjoy most, is going out there and picking it and enjoying that fresh fruit or utilizing that juice or whatever the case may be. 
But for all of these fruit crops, there are tasks that need to be done during the entire calendar year almost. So some, some much more demanding than others. But this is just a great calendar to show that, that there's going to be specific times to apply that fertilizer. There's going to be pruning that needs to occur. Or there's going to be some sort of renovation that needs to happen. If I've got... If I have matted rose strawberries, if I'm going to keep that in production over a longer period of time, then I, <clears throat> then I need to be <clears throat> renovating in a manner that, that maintains that productivity. Otherwise, there'll be so many plants in there, they'll just crowd each other out and you'll have uh, little fingernail type strawberries because there's so many plants and so competing for moisture and sunlight and nutrients as well. So I just think this is kind of a great Visual to show that there's going to be a lot happening during the course of the year. And also for the different fruit crops that we might grow, there's, there's a timeline for the harvest. And, and this can work to our advantage because we're going to be harvesting one fruit, then we'll be ready for the next one, then we'll be ready for the next one. And when I think about these small fruits, I think about strawberries coming first, and then blackberries, and then blueberries, and then... And then I guess grapes would be, as they kind of kind of follow the calendar, at least for us and the growers that I've worked with in, in Sumner County. And this is a great a great opportunity to to have a something coming in, fresh fruit that you can enjoy. Number one, and then if you want to utilize that. So of course for the grape varieties, all kinds of choices, and some better for juice and and wine making. We've got the, the different types. You're all familiar with those. And the ones that are more difficult to grow. And certainly there's going to be a difference in the pounds. Of, I'm going to go back to that measure again. Pounds of fruit that's harvested per plant. And how soon it's going to get there. Grafted versus non-grafted. Going to be those differences. But yet some of, some of the advantages, and especially in looking at the grafted, the resistance to the phyl phylloxera. <clears throat> Muscadines seem to be getting, well, I guess maybe it's kind of an ebb and flow because we seems like over the years we've, we've had this uh, tremendous increase in interest in muscadines and it kind of wavered for a little bit. But, but I, I have a grower who's set out 500 plants last year and he's, he's increasing that amount and going to add some different varieties now for this year. And of course, the training system, making a choice here of which one you're going to use. And I, I just, to provide the information that all of you know for sure that, that you have to maintain these plants on that trellis system. Uh, this is some information that came out of one of Dr. Lockwood's presentations to talk about bunch scrapes and says 15, 15 to 20 pounds of fruit per vine and one and a half gallons of juice. That equals one and a half gallons of juice. So that, that says to me, you know, there are, there are lots of uh, solids that we're not going to be able to utilize if, if we're going for the juice. For the muscadines, much more productive per vine, and then ending up with the three and a half gallons of juice per vine. Does that what kind of fit? cause muscadines to just grow but never fruit? Grow but never fruit. I, I gave up after about four years because I had mad. I mean, vines would grow like crazy, but I never got more than a handful of fruit off of it. What variety? I had a couple of different varieties. I had white, red. Uh, some of the old varieties were not selling fruit. I gave up on my whole mouth. I was never there a good, probably five years. I mean, it was bush like crazy, but I never got the fruit off of it at all. I know it's a lot of them that's had a plant with a female. I have, yeah. You could have a vine, and I've had some in my house that grow beautifully and bloom. Uh -huh. There's never any fruit because they're all made. Okay. So it may have been what they sent me. They weren't supposed to, but. <laughs> well, and I think in that slide that I had earlier, did it say muscadines needed a cross? They needed a cross to happen. 
I was supposed to have had an order from a, okay. you know, from a grower and was supposed to have had just what I would have needed from the do well. Especially, if, you know, the, there's this interest in muscadines, but Dr. Lockwood says, you know, we still, there's that uh, hardiness issue for, especially us in the northern part of, as we get closer to the Kentucky line and the vines being killed back in fact. That's one of the concerns I have for, for the grower that I have that set out to 500 plants last year, is to consider where we are in Middle Tennessee and how strange our winters can be and, and experience that killing all the way back to the ground and then you're starting all over again. And we're, and we're hoping you know, that, that the whole vine's not killed, but it does happen. So the challenges, of course, diseases are the best, are, are the biggest challenge I, I see for grapes. And um, our summers, the high humidity, frequent rain, rain events. Good, good Lord, last year, just a, it just was no way. I don't care what kind of fruit you were growing last year. There was just no way to provide the protection that all the fruit crops needed to get through there. Uh, I measured. 14 inches at my house in the month of June last year. And, you know, when you start figuring out that that's almost a half an inch a day, there's just... And, and so what's happening during that time? Well, for us, strawberries are finishing up at the first of the month if they made it that far. And that the rains set in, there's just no way that you can keep the, that fruit from being affected by disease. And it just feels, feels that way for so many of the other fruit crops grapes being really the next best challenge or the next hardest challenge. Sun scald, when they lose their foliage, high temperatures during harvest, you know, that's just um, some of those challenges that we deal with. Of course, black rot, heard a little bit of discussion this morning about black rot, one of those tremendously problematic <coughs> diseases in grapes and uh, thinking about so many sources of the inoculum, whether it's going to be on the mummified grapes that are hanging or if, or if they haven't, if they've been removed, are there any laying on the ground? And even, even on the leaves then, it, so it's how much sanitation is so important in, in the vineyard. Powdery mildew, if you're sh showing effect on the leaf, the cane and the fruit, all of, all of that and, and being a mildew that's you know, doesn't require moisture. And then the downy mildew as well, thinking about those conditions that are conducive to diseases and how in the world are we going to try to be able to control those. Well, there's some disease-resistant grape varieties, and I thought this was a great table to include in, with some of the different grape varieties and, and choices that you might be able to make. So really, if we start with a minus one, he says, when well, you think about it for a year before you get in a hurry and you go out there and you plant those, plant those vines, really consider that site selection because in the, line, in the long run, that's going to end up being the determining factor on how successful you are with whatever fruit that you plant. And the first year, the planting, training, trellising, pruning and training, second and third year, he says first year, fourth year, that first commercial crop, and then move into full production on that fifth year. So, again, bringing the plant and developing the plant. When we're talking about these perennial crops, truly perennial crops, I don't, I don't consider matted row berries to be a truly perennial crop. And we're going to get two or three years, and we're going to be renovating along the way. But with the investment that we have with these grapes and blueberries, for sure, and uh, and blackberries. Or the cane berries, if we choose some of those other cane berries, a lot of renovation that happens, but, but they're going to be productive for a, a long time if things go well. So let's look at some cane berries, and th these used to be called brambles. They changed the term. So when we're looking at blackberries and raspberries and such, grow well in temperature in the mid 80s we've got these thorn and thornless varieties and we've got erect and semi-erect and we have trailing varieties and most varieties are floor cane bearers 
And then the, the raspberries, uh, I, I'm talking with some people that are really having some more success with raspberries these days than, than I remember in the past. I mean, all I, really, all I remember in the past is people saying, well, you know, we just can't grow raspberries here. This is, our summer's just wearing us out. We can't get through that. But, but I'm having uh, conversations with homeowners that are being much more successful these days. So we look at the biennial life cycle of the cane. So in the first year that prima cane grows throughout the summer, initiates that fruit bud that occurs in late summer and early fall. So we're, in other words, we're setting those buds toward the end of the growing season. And then that next year, it's completed. We've got bloom, fruiting, and then the cane dies. And all during that time, the, the new prima canes have grown during that crop year. So this is this is really turns out to be black blackberry stories. Turns out to be one of you know people. I don't think people consider how much maintenance blackberries require to be really productive, and also productive in a in a sense of producing the fruit. Going back to pounds, you might end up with some pounds, but if, but if you can have fewer canes or fewer buds, and you're going to end up with the same or more pounds and a higher quality fruit because you've got that better sun exposure. So for the erect, Kiowa, a wet, erect, and thorned, if you can get past the thorns, Kiowa is a good variety there. The erect, thornless, this, this, uh, University of Arkansas continues to, to develop new, new varieties, and there's some others that have come on. I can't remember exactly where the Columbia Star came on. It was just released. I've seen it, I've seen it listed two ways, Columbia Star and Columbia Giant. But it's, it's just been released as a new variety. And, but a Washita and Natchez and Osage are these thornless, erect varieties that are recommended for us in Tennessee. Triple crown, semi-erect and thornless, ripening time late June, July, 60 to 75 pounds per 10 foot of row. I think it depends on which variety you're looking at if you consider how much that yield or how that yield fits. If you're going for total pounds, which is going to be that, that uh, increase in juice, if that's what you're looking for, then triple crown will be more productive. I looked at several different estimates of, of harvest and pounds, and uh, Triple Crown was not the largest yielder, but almost the largest yielder, and much more above, you know, 100, 100 pounds or so above a Washita, Natchez, and some of those. So if you're, if you're going for pounds and juice, then you might to choose the triple crown. Just check check that out and consider that. I can't remember if it's tri triple crown or though and there's there's one of those high yielding varieties that one of the they'll tell you that one people that will talk about it will say, well one thing they don't like about it is the larger seed. So you want to keep that in mind if that's something that you want to consider Join it some way or some way besides uh, the juice. So the floor cane, second year you're going to get the partial crop. So again, we're not we're not going for a full crop that first fruiting year. Third and successful succeeding years, you're going to do the full crop crop, and, and eight, so eight to ten years or more. And uh, so much so much of it depends on the variety you select and how you care for that variety over that period. And yes, some different choices of trellis systems. For this particular one, it's the T trellis, and you, you, this this person has pulled the fruiting canes to the wires and hanging on. And right now, the floor canes, well, the prime canes, are forming right down that center. So you don't you know you don't see any berries down that center. That's where the new prime canes are. So how the pruning takes place over time, uh, once the floor canes reach that point where the top of the trellis is or maybe five or six inches above where you want to stop it. 
Otherwise, it'll just keep on growing, keep on flowering. And so you just have more fruit. It'll end up being smaller, though, because it's feeding through that entire cane. But even at that, we're going to top off at five feet or so, let the laterals develop. Late winter, we're going to come back, and we're even going to take off some of those laterals, most of the laterals to leave some of that uh, fruit, the fruiting buds. And also, if there's something that's that 18 inches or lower to the ground, that's going to be shaded, and we're just going to have to remove that anyway. So a lot to maintain blackberries, it takes a lot of prep, not, and not just one trip to get that done. Any questions about blackberries? Yes. Weeds. <coughs> What's the best way to control weeds? Uh, blackberries. At Pick, at Pick Tennessee last week, let's see what crop was it? There, there are some newer options. Seems like Chateau was one. Chateau, you can go you can go to the southern region, Small Fruit Consortium. Go to their website, and there are production production guides there. And if you if you send me an email and you ask me that question, I'll I'll see if I have that information about it. Is it something you can spray that will not kill them? Yes. Yes. Okay. That'd be fantastic. I've got right. two hundred feet of blackberries. I mean, they produce like crazy, but weeds are a nightmare. In there. I ain't right. used to getting up pulling weeds by hand. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Well, there was there was a lot of discussion at the Pick Tennessee conference with those commercial producers that were in the room and, and considering what options. And you know, a lot of people have been trying to um, watch the weeds and watch the calendar and what's happening with the weather and take a chance on some Roundup application before the berries or the canes emerge and, and that's just becoming less predictable to be able to do without some injury and then also you know if, if that's all that you're doing then you're developing you're developing some resistant plants which is what's happening with some of our other commercial crops and so the, the, the speaker came from the University of Georgia and had, had done some research been looking at some other options and as I recall there, there were so pre-emerge so there were some pre-emerge and, and I think there were some post-emerge options but it depended on the weed but pre-emerge surf land was one okay. surf land surf land was one that was effective as a pre-emergent and it seemed like there was another one or two that had done some research and some, some, some newer chemistries that have been released, but I remember the surf land. And then for something post-emerge, as I, I've been looking at some recommendations this week for some fruit crops, and, and, it, and in fact someone called me about strawberries yesterday, and so I looked at what was in there for pre-emerge and post-emerge, and you know, in some of these fruit crops, there are not, not a lot of options for pre-emerge, especially if the calendar and, or the weather is working against you. And then for post-emerge, it depend, again goes back to the weed, and there's just not a whole lot of options really for broadleaves because you've got, you're dealing with a broadleaf plant. We, can, we have some options related for grasses, but also some of them we can't use until after harvest is done. So you can't, you can't use on a bearing on their fruiting, harvesting. Good question. Anything else related to? So let's look at blueberries. So we, we continue, this is one of the fruits that we continue to have more and more options as well and, and thinking of high bush and rabbit eye varieties and of course the rabbit eye varieties are the ones that are native varieties to the southeast and uh, more tolerant of our soil conditions, and more tolerant of if the pH is a little bit out of range there. Uh, a little bit later harvest, but it, it's, it's unique in a sense, and I don't, I don't know if this is in another slide, but, but high bush varieties, which are the northern varieties, high bush varieties flower later and fruit earlier. 
than ragged eyes. So that's why, you know, that's kind of why the Southeast moved in that direction was trying to get past the loss of the rabbit eyes because they'd be blooming and have blooms killed by late frost. And then, yes, sir. Is the water the other that has on the average better flavor? Better blueberry flavor? Say that again. High bush. High bush. First of you know, I, I, I have never heard of that that the flavor is appreciably different. That they both have varieties that measure different bricks as far as that, that goes. Of course, we're looking at that pH again, 4.8 to 5.2, really important. Uh, first crop should be the third year. I, I priced some plants for a commercial grower last week. <clears throat> and so you, they're out there, two two year old plants. So you're buying you're buying a two year old plant. So that first crop is not going to be when it's three years old because you've grown it for a year. It's three years old, but it's not ready for that first crop. So you're talking, looking at it. it's already two years old. Dave says let it grow three, four, then begin the harvest. You might be doing some pruning. You know, forming of the plant along the way, but if you really want it to develop as a perennial plant for you and be a productive producer for a long time, you don't want to harvest. You don't. So, so you're going to be removing. You're either removing the blooms or removing the fruit very early in development. Yes. Can you successfully grow those in large containers? Yes, you can. I guess it would it would depend on the microclimate where that is. You know, if I have a good place that's not on the north side or fully exposed, I, I, if I had on, on the front side of my house it faces the south and, and it's kind of protected from the north and east winds and and uh, so I wouldn't have any problem having container there. But then on the back side of my house, it's fully exposed to the north sun or the north wind, north wind there, and it can be brutal. I, I, that there might not be enough insulation capability with that pot to fully protect the, the roots during that time. So I get so especially on the outside too, our humidity level can can drop very low during the winter. And so in that case, if I'm, I'm going to need to maintain some amount of moisture level within that pot to, well, for two reasons. Uh, roots exposed to air dry out and die. But also, uh, the, I, I want to maintain enough moisture in that container because this water is the greatest insulator of all. Yield per plant, 15 pounds, he says. So we talked about some of these qualities here. High bush, of course, they're more winter hardy, less prone to frost damage because of that. So now they've got northern and southern, so they have they have crossed, so they call them a southern high bush. They ripen earlier and they have that more concentrated harvest season. So <clears throat> If you want to have a flush of production, then you'll plant a single type of blueberry. So you're going to concentrate your harvest. If you want to enjoy blueberries over a longer calendar period, then you'll plant different cultivars. Rabbit eye, high bush, southern high bush. You'll make some choices along that way. And that's, that's another reason that the commercial producers have headed in that direction. <clears throat> so here's some of the varieties. Fruit size, chilling requirement. Um, some of these are pretty, pretty popular varieties for us. I, I know some, we've got some Sumner County producers that have grown Premier, Bright, bright Blue, Powder Blue, Centurion. 
a centurion, they did some research at the Highland Rim experiment, the Highland Rim Research and Education Center in Springfield. Set out an acre of blueberries, gosh, I guess it's been 10, 15 years ago now, and they used centurion as a pollinator. They planted it within the whole plot, utilizing it primarily as a pollinator, but they were really ended up being really impressed with the quality of that particular berry in, in that time. But, but some of these, the rest of these, and, and again, remember how, how important cross-pollination is, and so if you have several plants, you're going to spread them out around, not singly, and then the next variety. Southern high bush, Ozark blue. Yes, I've heard that one. Again, you see how the chilling requirements, some are similar enough, and then others have a higher chilling requirement. Usually it's not a problem for us, though. Northern high bush, Elliot, I've heard of some Elliot being, and Duke, had a grower, a grower that planted Duke. <coughs> Blue Ray, another variety that I'm aware of. So here's that timeline again to deep fruit, one, two, that's after the planting. So really, if you buy, so if you purchase these two year old plants, you're, and we would be planting those now, as soon as we can, right now. Which means that we should have, in order to be best prepared for that, then we should have uh, soil tested last fall, applied the sulfur, incorporated the sulfur last fall if that pH needed to be changed. So we're, so we're ready. <coughs> Here's our issue with our fruits today. And it's this little fruit fly type pest spotted boy drosophila came in from Asia and you see the female and the male and the female is the one that does the real problem because she pierces the skin with her ovipositor as she lays eggs so so uh, that's really affected our blueberry production because we before this drosophila arrived on the scene the skin of the blueberry was tough enough that we didn't have a pest that would be penetrating and affecting the fruit. Well, that time has passed. And so now we have this problem to deal with. And so it's also moved to the other fruit crops, including strawberry, blackberry, raspberry, blueberry, <coughs> grape, all of them, because it has that ability, again, she can pierce that skin and lay that, lay that egg or those eggs. We have seen, and, and so we're going to go back to fruiting the fruiting calendar. So for us, we start with strawberries. That's going to be our earliest one. So we move strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, grapes. So far, at least we're in, in Summer County, we had had a real problem with spotted wing drosophila in strawberries because it's so far it's happened that we're cool enough that they're not really very active in affecting the fruit. But by the time, and, and I've, we've done some, I've put out some traps on some different locations in some different patches. By the time blackberries are approaching ripe, ripening, then the population, we're warm enough that the population really increases quickly. So from, from that point on then, the grower, and, and if you're the homeowner, you have to make that decision too. And you might set out one of those traps to see if you can catch them. Make a decision on what, what your uh, plan for control is going to be. So you can see that there are some, these wild hosts Pokeweed, autumn olive, crab apple, nightshade, wild grape, dogwood. So we, we've got an abundance of some of those hosts in our area. Talk about uh, strawberries, matted row. Expected life of the planting three to four years. Uh, 25 plants will give excess of 40 pounds of fruit one year after planting. We've got early glow, jewel, all-star, and dar select. So we're doing this. <coughs> 
There, there, there's not a lot of research going on these days for matted rose strawberry varieties because the commercial industry is gone, plastic culture, and that's the direction where most of the research is headed. So you're going to plant late winter, early spring. If you if you plant this spring, you can order order your plants now. You plant this spring, you grow them through the year, you let them run and peg out, make your mat. You'll be looking at a fertilization program that happens this fall, so they'll set their fruit buds. Strawberries set their fruit buds in the fall before they fruit the next spring. So you want to be prepared for how that happens. 18 to 24 inches, but they're going to be filling that in. I'd like to end up with that six inches to a foot. Really, I like a foot space, square foot per plant, so that it can be able to do its best. Renovation, irrigation, weed control. Weed control can be a real problem for you. Uh, for me, and I, I, I don't have any strawberries now, but once upon a time, we had a I set them out pretty thick, one 25 foot row, 30 foot row, and I put them about a foot apart. But I main, I maintained that three and a half to four foot wide band there for about three years. But eventually, weeds initially weeds weren't a problem, and I never used any herbicide in them. But but eventually weeds did become a problem. So after harvest, you want to mow them off. So so you want to. Think about coming in in July or so and mowing them off because in August then they're come, they're going to, once the moisture the days get a little bit shorter. We're going to, if we provide the moisture, they'll they'll rejuvenate. They'll come out with some new growth, and then that's when we want to consider that fall fertilization to help them set those fruit buds and be prepared be prepared for the winter. We want to let that fertilizer be done though, so they'll so they'll go dormant like they need to. See there in August, that's when you want to make that application that includes nitrogen, providing, providing that energy to set those fruit buds. Might even consider a pyramid here. We've got 24, 24 plants, different tiers, and so you can, see, what does it say? For, for this many plants in this particular formation, 24 plants, 7 to 14 quarts ever bearing, 14 to 28 quarts June bearing, and all those that were listed earlier, they're June bearing varieties. Day neutral, 14 to 40 quarts. The day neutral varieties and the ever bearing varieties, though, that, that harvest is going to be an extended harvest. You're going to get a little bit, you can enjoy it with your cereal in the mornings, but those June, June bearing varieties, you're going to have. They might go for three or four weeks, but you're going to have that period of a week or ten days or two weeks that's going to be a flush, a flush of production. So uh, this is this is the information that I found out there about how much juice per pound of fruit. And I figured that it would be a lot easier to find than it was. For, so for blackberries per pound, I'm going to get four ounces of fruit. Blueberries, three ounces. Grapes were the most productive as far as juice goes. Eight ounces per pound. Strawberries, four to five ounces per pound. So you consider then, if I'm going to get that much per pound, and you look at the yields per, and when I uh, think of strawberries, strawberries, uh, 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 it's a, a, an average. An average of a pound and a half of strawberries equals a quart. So I'm con converting that volume to actual pounds. On average, a pound and a half of strawberries equals a quart. <coughs> Dave swapped his slide a little bit here or, or got the, the errors and the difference the reason that blueberries aren't on top the easiest the easiest to grow is because of that spotted wing drosophila that fly but if you look down this list mus muscadines and blueberries they're still easier to grow than strawberries 
Then we've got raspberries, blackberries, and grapes, of course, being the most problematic disease primarily, but for pest control, ease of growing. For home plantings, we've got a publication that's available online that provides a spray schedule for all of the fruit crops, the home fruit plantings, including fruit trees and all, all the crops that I've talked about and a few more. And it, it's, not, it's not available in uh, hard copy anymore, but you can get it online. Questions? We've got about one minute or two. All right. By yes, sir. The slide, by the slide, you were saying grapes are the hardest to grow. Yes. So you can grow grapes, you pretty much grow anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just going to say I'll let you interpolate that how you have your life. <laughs> Any other questions? You mentioned the fish with blueberries. Yes. Are there traps or what? No. Well, I, I think they're probably I, I think they're probably available out there, but they're what I'm going to say to you is they're very simple to make. I mean, you get it, you get you a. 16, 16 ounce plastic cup and you put some little holes in it and you put a yeast mixture or there's a mixture that you put in there and you hang it out. And there it's it's like how, how we catch fruit flies in our kitchen. You know, you mix that little vinegar solution and put yeah. put the lid on with the holes in it. So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to attract them to that. So first of all, you can see how many you catch. And then you can also see uh, what size they are to get an understanding about how's the population and how's it growing. And then to then you decide then okay, what's my next step in trying to control this pest? Am I going to go institute a spray? If if you're going to have any success, you're going to have to. Really. Otherwise, it will just continue. And, and that's the, you know, if you're growing blackberries and blueberries and grapes, those three, if, if, you, if they're present when your blackberries are approaching ripeness, then you know they're going to be there for the other fruit crops as they come into ripeness as well. So you want to get some control. Yes, ma'am. And then draw them. To your side, like the Japanese people. No. No. Yes. What chemicals are most effective against? <clears throat> it depends on the fruit crop. I'm, I'm thinking probably uh, permethrin would be one that would be most. Any of the THRN products, THRIN products, if they are labeled for use in fruits, then they're they're going to be the ones that have a little bit more residual as well. Yes, ma'am. Ladybugs eat these. No. Is there any predators you can put out there? Not that I'm aware of. No, we we were. No. So uh, two questions. We got slaughtered by Japanese beetles last year. Do you think that some brambles that are wild located close to that probably had something to do with that? Maybe we've got a lot of wild blackberry and raspberries. No, I don't. I don't. I, you know, and Japanese beetles, uh, from year to year, they they can be so sporadic in how they hit and how hard they hit, and and really the the uh, what influences their opportunity more than anything is how hot and dry it was the year before when they were laying eggs. And then the other questions. Uh, Organically speaking, what would you say the best thing for black rot to spray? Is that a schedule that you put out? No, organically there wouldn't be. So, and there wouldn't be for black rot. Right. As best as I best put that in your question to me. But I'm thinking okay, sure. because I'm thinking, uh, and I thought about that earlier as I was driving down here today. You're look you're looking at something like copper or sulfur. Yeah, copper's the thing I've seen the most. Okay. So, so understanding about how careful we have to be with that application because both of those can be phytotoxic. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Where can you get certified for to spray down up in the Springfield area? Do you? 
is it a restricted use? You can go to your county extension office and talk with Jeff Smith, he's the new agent there. If you, if you need that private applicator certification, it is about four hours of watching video and training. And uh, now it's gotten, since the first of the year, it's gotten very expensive. It's $50 to the agent and then $25 to TDA. But it's good for three years. And this is a recertification year. Yes. Good question. Others? Thank you very much.